for recording this too. So welcome to the first bag lunch of the archeological research facility on, I guess, a rainy blustery day here. And I first wanted to, my name is Christine Hastorf and I am the current director of the archeological research facility. And I just wanna say that the next lunchtime talk, uh, which is a week from today at exactly this time will be um, by a visiting scholar here at UC Berkeley, a postdoctoral researcher from the Universidad de Valencia, Esther Parpel. And she's speaking on revisiting the figures of the Queens, expressions of gender and power in the classic Maya court. So that will be fun next week. And I um, would like to say that while we have been doing land acknowledgements for quite a while, we're taking a, a pause right now to kind of work on creating a more action plan highlighting um, uh, engagement with Native Americans rather than just reciting what we were uh, given by indigenous, local indigenous groups about two years ago. So we're sort of gonna revisit it rather than just going on the same. So uh, that will be on our website too when we um, uh, get that re reorganized. But today I'm very happy and pleased to have our very own Bill White who uh, resides in this building um, as well as many of us. And he is an associate professor here in the anthropology department at UC Berkeley and has been working on a series of projects before he got here and now here. And I believe here we're gonna get just one of many projects this time. So it's nice to get a different viewpoint. I mean, a different data set from his other examples that he gave us last year. So uh, while he does work in, uh, I would say, uh, African-American descent communities in many places, I believe this one is going to be in the continental United mm -hmm. States. So uh, that will be exciting because I haven't heard about it before. So mm -hmm. without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium and the microphone over to Bill White. So thank you very much, Bill. Okay. Thanks for that introduction. Conservation Act was engaging with uh, African diaspora sites in the United States. I guess I'll have two microphones. That's okay. Two hands, two microphones. No lunch, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, really quickly this talk, I want to make sure that there's enough time for questions at the end because all of us, as people who live in the United States, pay taxes here, we're paying into the system. So this is the system that we've got. Uh, but what's great is that it's flexible and that we can actually uh, make changes. They don't happen easy, but they can be made. So the talk I want to discuss a little bit of background, try to catch people up on the way the National Historic Preservation Act works as far as historic preservation in the United States. Some of the stuff that uh, my colleagues noticed with the way that the um, regulations were being executed when it comes to uh, African-American sites, then talk a little bit about the Black Heritage Resources Task Force. It was a uh, committee of individuals who are working across universities and companies and agencies to make some recommendations. Uh, and then um, some, some bright spots that we saw and some directions that we can take this in the future. Okay, like I mentioned before, uh, working in cultural resource management, um, the National Historic Preservation Act ends up being kind of the backbone of the different historic preservation structures that we have. And if you look at the original sections, the, the beginning, the preamble to this, it really has some high-minded goals uh, to create legislation that acknowledges 
the importance of heritage sites to people who live in the United States and that it's the federal government's um, uh, obligation to preserve or to make sure that these things are available for future generations. And uh, you know, this one, and then also the National Environmental Policy Act signed in the late 60s, they really um, come on the heels of years and years of advocacy for environmental protections, historic preservation. And in the case of the National Historic Preservation Act, it also uh, consolidates many different federal historic preservation acts like the Historic Sites Act, the Antiquities Act, but also sets kind of a, a standardized guideline for other states to follow, right? And calls for a mandate for them to do this. And so for better or for worse, this one really kind of sets this, this tone and this role model that you know a lot of other countries and a lot of organizations are kind of emulating the system. Uh, so it's actually spreading beyond the United States. So I'm not gonna go into um, extreme depths with the National Historic Preservation Act, I want people to stay awake. But uh, a couple of the things it does is it formally sets in federal law the uh, National Register for Historic Places, which is an index of historic sites and historic properties across the United States. And it also has an advisory council that's uh, partially appointed by the president that really adjudicates these things at the federal level, but also shares information and gives guidance to uh, state historic preservation offices, communities, uh, and also, you know, government agencies on how they should handle historic properties. Uh, some of the other stuff it does is it establish the uh, state historic preservation offices. So the law calls for states to conduct statewide surveys of historic properties. That's an ongoing task. Actually, that is delegated by most states to cultural resource management companies and other uh, agency archaeologists in the case of archaeology. But um, at the state level, the State Historic Preservation Office kind of ends up being the one that agencies are trying to uh, report to. So if you identify an archaeology site, they're the ones who's decide, you know, making sure that your recommendation is correct, that you've actually followed all the, you know, uh, protocols, that it fits the, the strictures. But the State Historic Preservation Act also maintains that register for the federal government. So the law says it's the federal government's job, then they delegated it to the states, and then the states delegates it down to you know, actual archeologists. Um, in order to do that, the law also sets aside these pretty clear criteria, which you know, it's as clear as mud, and then a process of what would even cause folks to go look for historic properties. So it asks the federal government to do this. They pass it down to the states, the US territories, um, but at least there's a system that was uh, standardized across the country at the time when it was enacted. There was local regulations and then certain organizations like the National Park Service, they have their own rules and it wasn't really you know, clear. Um, so the other thing that it does is um, uh, it's, it's kind of become, like I said, the template for other uh, states, counties, cities. So uh, you know, we could, I teach an entire class on this. We could go for literally 16 weeks <laughs> talking about just this law. Uh, but the one thing to think about is that this is funded by partially by the Historic Preservation Fund. So that money comes from the federal government through partial uh, uh, oil and gas offshore leases, and it's handed out to states based on population, and the states are supposed to match that funding. In order to qualify for that funding, uh, they need to have some kind of a plan on how they're going to handle historic preservation in their state. So you'll see later on that these historic preservation plans and this historic preservation fund become really critical because the National Register and that fund is administered by the National Park Service. So moving on, you know, um, uh, like I said, you know, this, we have, we have really in the United States shoehorned a lot of historic properties under this different rubric that I'm gonna explain, but to catch people up, under the National Historic Preservation Act, historic properties are these five kind of things that are, you know, bounded entities that exist in the present world that have material values. They can be measured, they can be observed in the material world, right? So um, what, what consulting archeologists are doing is they're looking for things that could potentially be listed in the National Register or are already listed. Now, most of the time states know where the things that are in the National Register are already at. It's these sites that have not yet been identified. That's what archeologists are really looking for. So like I said, clear as mud, right? So <laughs> folks are probably gonna have to pause on the screen for a while. Um, they're looking for those five kinds of properties, objects, structures, buildings, and sites, and then districts are composed of more than one of those things in a bounded area that have integrity, 
There's seven aspects of integrity. And there's also four criteria of significance associated with important events, important people have distinctive characteristics or have the potential to yield data. And so what um, uh, archaeologists and, and architectural historians and what you know, folks who work in this that do the consulting for the State Historic Preservation Office, this is the equation that they're trying to do. So they're trying to look for these five different kinds of things that are over 50 years that meet these criteria significance and also have the ability to convey that uh, significance. You know, it seems like it's quite straightforward, but it actually takes years and years of practice of applying these different things, even for, you know, archeological sites, even for things that you would think are obviously significant to make this argument in such a way that it fulfills the criteria of the National Historic Preservation Act. Folks who do cultural resources, architectural historians, historians, uh, uh, cultural anthropologists that work in this entire field, you know, this is a really, uh, you know, complicated rubric because this, the, the law itself is long and then all the explaining documents from the National Park Service and the Advisory Council, they're also very difficult. Plus this has to comply with other federal regulations and the mandates of government agencies, right? So the, the, this is what folks are paying for when they get cultural resources consulting. People who know how to apply these rules have seen these many different kinds of historic resources and know how to work, at least in the case of this, at the federal level to you know, help keep the state and federal agencies in compliance with laws like the Historic Preservation Act. Okay, when it comes to um, applying this law, this, this federal law, it's not just randomly applied whenever, you know, folks get the urge to do it, right? In the case of government agencies, um, there's been a clear process described on why they would even initiate it. So first of all, the agency has to decide that they're going to be doing a thing that could destroy historic properties. Now, in the case of, you know, widening a road, obviously the bulldozer is going to go down the road and it could destroy things. But in the case of other things, it's not necessarily so clear, like expanding an Air Force base could increase sound volume that would resonate off traditional cultural properties in places that are far away and change the atmosphere of that thing. There could be you know, uh, changes in water levels that could affect other places or could increase water inundation in historic properties that are far away, right? So, so the government really has its work cut out for it, trying to figure out whether there's an undertaking. But once they decide that they are going to have an undertaking, they're supposed to notify the State Historic Preservation Office. In this case, there's also tribal historic preservation offices for federally recognized tribes that have them and start right away consulting with folks. The next step that they do is try to figure out whether they have the capacity to look for these historic properties or whether they need to hire a consultant to do it. If you're working in cultural resources, this step two and three and four is where you really come in. So step two, identifying them, that's going out and actually looking below the ground, all around, you know, with visual analysis, sound analysis, trying to decide whether this is going to actually adversely affect things that could be in the National Register, and then assess those effects and report that stuff back to the government agency. Now, the government agency, once they've decided that there's going to be, uh, um, you know, impacts, they're supposed to either avoid, mi minimize the impacts or mitigate those impacts. And in the case of archeology, span sometimes that means digging a portion of the site, that's the mitigation. But there's a wide range of other mitigations that can happen too. It's all supposed to be done in consultation with the State Historic Preservation Office, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, and other parties, traditional communities and other folks who live nearby, right? And they're also supposed to involve the public, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily have to listen to the public. So what we learn here is that that other parties piece, those other traditional communities, a lot of times black communities, Hispanic, just folks who live nearby, that's the thing that a lot of times slips through the crack. And there's also, a, you know, not always the most efficient means of dealing with the state historic preservation office or the tribal historic preservation office. So while all this stuff's going on, it's this crazy juggling series of events. One of the things that happens is a lot of communities never get to be part of that process. The other thing that, it, that you know, we notice and ends up happening is professional archaeologists are supposed to be out there identifying these sites and evaluating their significance using that rubric before of those properties in 50 years and, and all these, the, the historic uh, um, significance criteria. 
Then they make those recommendations. And then in the case of mitigating, if it involves excavating, skilled archaeologists are the ones who work. You know, with government agencies, they do the archaeology, right? But when it comes to African-American sites, there's not a lot of archaeologists who know any Black people. They're not trained to identify these Black heritage sites. And so those adverse effects that are supposed to be mitigated a lot of times don't get mitigated. So there's not consultation a lot of times. There's not even an identification that this thing could be potentially significant to Black communities. And so studies are showing in certain states that disproportionately African diaspora sites are getting adversely affected by construction. Sometimes this is just straight up you know, taking advantage of people who don't have the ability to defend themselves. But what we're realizing is structurally, there's no real mechanism at the State Historic Preservation Office level to do this kind of reach, outreach to African-Americans or other communities that are living there nearby. So that brings me to the, the work that we did over the last couple of years with the Black Heritage Resources Task Force. And at the end, I will share the links for the uh, reports that we wrote. Um, but there was conversations in about 2018 or 2019 to try and figure out what we could possibly do about this. It was associated with passing the uh, um, African-American uh, graves, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking out. No, no, not NAGPRA. Um, the the African-American Graves Identification Act, I can't remember it. Yeah, so it, it passed, right? But a lot of the, sp a lot of the sponsors, and actually that's a, a true miracle because it passed during the Trump administration and has carried on and, and it was bipartisanly supported by a lot of different people. And so that's, it's really interesting to see how it unfolds. But what we realize is it's not just black cemeteries that are getting overlooked. It's a lot of different other sites. So Joe Joseph, who um, works at New South Associates and Maria Franklin were really instrumental on in getting together a panel of folks who would work together that were part of state historic preservation offices, the National Park Service, cultural resources companies, professors, African-American archeologists to try to analyze what's going on with the system and is there anything that we could possibly do? So there's, you know, there's really kind of five things that we spent a couple of years working on. Um, literature review, we look to see what are the studies that states are doing, who has published on that people's dissertations, who's reported about how this disproportionately impacts uh, black sites. Um, and then the other thing that we did is we collected all those state historic preservation plans. So every state in U.S. territory every 10 years is supposed to file that plan with the National Park Service to stay in compliance so that they can access that historic preservation fund. States like California, it's supposed to be a match. So the government gives a certain amount of money based on population for the state, and then the state is supposed to match with that or more, right? In California, they spend more than the federal government's match to handle historic preservation. Places like Arizona kind of don't even match it. They just only use the federal government money to stay in compliance with a law that they feel is a federal law. And so the government should pay for it, right? So not every state is at the same space, but to get the money, they do have to have one of these plans. And those are made available. We could look through these plans and then we could look through them and see what are they doing for increasing diversity in their offices, addressing African-American sites, and then just overall, what, you know, how are they considering black heritage in their states? The other thing we did is we had, uh, we built surveys and surveyed state historic preservation offices. They didn't all respond, but the majority of them did respond to the uh, uh, quantitative survey. And then we had follow-up surveys with many of them and asked these state historic preservation officers, well, what's going on? Like how we've noticed these trends, you know, what are you, how come this is happening? Is there any way we can help you? What are the shortfalls? You know, what are some obstacles? How can this be improved in your state? And so after a year and a half or so of doing that, we spent another uh, months you know, crunching the data to really figure out what our state historic preservation office is doing and then what can we as U.S. citizens really do to, to help this process. I mean, we're paying for it, so we might as well try to get it to work for us. And so, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the findings. We, we published two white papers and also the, the survey data is available on TDAR. So it's, it's out there. Folks can uh, sign up and, and look at the just the raw data, but also our recommend or our findings. And then I had, you know, we made recommendations to the state historic preservation offices and the major archaeology organizations that were sponsors of this. But we also made them to the National Park Service. And we also tried to reach out to some states are doing really well when it comes to black heritage sites to let them know, you know, hey, you all are kind of in the lead here. 
it'd be great if you could make some best practices for many other states who are not really thinking in this direction, right? So, you know, our key finding, right? <laughs> Surprise. State historic preservation offices are not compelling the archaeologists in their state to really identify black sites. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Some of it is not really the state historic preservation offices written mandate to require them to do that. While they do need to require people to go through that algorithm of properties and 50 years and all that, they don't have to get us to care about African-American, Native, like they don't have to get anyone to care about anything. And so that was the thing that we heard most often. Well, they never told us to do it, right? So that's not, the other thing that we heard is we're underwater with the stuff that we actually already have because our state doesn't support it. That's also a thing. And then now I can't say the word race at work because I'll get fired. So that's another thing, right? So there's, it's not that they're malevolent individuals who want to cause harm. There's just many mechanisms that are preventing it from happening at the state level. Uh, some of our recommendations too, to you know, the survey, the, the conversations with folks is um, to add ethnic affiliation to the site forms. So what we've learned is many states don't even have a way to record that a site is African-American. They can really only write down that it's prehistoric or historical slash European American. And so history begins when Europeans arrive, regardless of whether you speak Portuguese or are from another country or are black, right? So that's not even a mechanism that many states even record this information. Uh, the other thing that is, you know, folks who've lived here in California know, there's no real mechanism to digitize and make these things available. So some states, like I worked in Washington state and Arizona, they have many of their site forms digitized and available online. And if you're a qualified archeologist, a professional, you can access these different site records and you can see different things that are going on just with a request and sometimes a check. Folks who've worked in California know there's some places that have paper maps with archeology span sites written on them. They have paper journals that they charge you 25 cents a page to download. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different range of things going on. The other thing is some of these existing digital data are in file types that have not been migrated and that we're talking like hundreds of thousands of buildings and sites, right? Uh, we also learned that a lot of times the buildings database is not with the archaeology site database. So it's difficult to find ones that are historic properties that are buildings that aren't archaeology sites. So one of the things that we we're you know, wondering is like, can we develop a program to really e evaluate these existing sources and then also add in this different granular way of recording sites so that you could even know your state has black history sites. Um, the other thing too that we thought you know, would be great uh, and that we've seen in several states is that they have statewide historic context for African-American sites. Um, those contexts are really important because as I was mentioning before, those cultural resources archaeologists, they're trying to scramble to address the significance of all different kinds of sites, different time periods, different uh, tribes, ethnic groups, all this different stuff. And most of them, as we know, didn't study black history for their master's degree, right? So they're tasked with handling the heritage sites of all Americans without having any kind of background data and that these you know, statewide historic contexts are written by historians, by architectural historians, professors, archeologists, and they really kind of give people an idea of black history in that state so that cultural resources folks can kind of open it up and know, oh, I'm in this county. Okay, so here's the events that happened in this county or in this town from this time to this, this is the major neighborhoods, right? It really, it really helps them out so that they don't have to get a degree in black history, but they still are aware of African-American sites. And then the other thing is it it uh, raises the visibility of the black heritage sites that they already have because they're in there and historians write about them and then they become known and easily accessible by archaeologists, right? The other thing too is increased black involvement. And some states do have uh, um, African-American heritage commissions that are liaisons with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, in the case of black heritage sites. And the other thing too is to have African-Americans be part of that review process for national re register significance. So get people who are there. These states have skilled historians and architects and, and people who know about black history to get those folks involved and put together some best practices for states that, that need to move forward that, that don't have this stuff already. So I mentioned before, uh, archeologists are looking for sites that 
could be eligible for listing in the National Register, but they don't actually fill the full form out to get them in the register because the government agency just needs to know that there's a potentially significant site. It doesn't have to actually be in the register. It just has to have the potential for them to have to do the mitigation. So many times archeology span sites exist. They even do massive archeology span projects there, but they never get added to the register. That's a whole nother level of you know, work. So try to get more black sites in there, increase the visibility, but also in the process, you get more African-Americans involved with the process so that they figure out how to do it. Because one of the things that I've heard many times from you know, black folks is they don't realize that they actually are supposed to be consulted on under the National Historic Preservation Act. They think it's just Native Americans you know, communities, not just black people that have been living there for years are supposed to be consulted with, right? And then the other thing is to think more along the lines of traditional cultural properties when we're thinking about these uh, African-American sites. Because in the case of, you know, black neighborhoods or black properties, they've been modified sometimes so that they, under the law, don't technically demonstrate that integrity for the National Historic Preservation Act. Therefore, they're not considered significant, even though black people have owned it for 80 years. And then they, they, you know, are discounted as not a contributing element, not potentially eligible. So think about them for their cultural value, not just purely on the architecture or, you know, purely on the site. Right. But then the, the biggest thing here, you know, and this is, you know, not just limited only to African-Americans, increased diversity. Right. As this task force spent two years focusing on black heritage sites, we realized that the majority of folks heritage is not necessarily being covered. And even folks that are spelled out in law, Native American tribes, federally recognized ones, uh, Alaskan natives, Native Hawaiians, they're also not getting served by the law, right? And there's many reasons behind that. So having more indiv individuals uh, uh, empowered and able to work on this stuff themselves, that's a huge thing. And then, you know, building on examples from Native American folks, indigenous people, just acquiring the property and then they can manage it for their community helping black property owners access the tax benefits that come along with historic preservation is another way that can really, that can really help. So I'm moving into the, the end here. Here's some of the, the bright examples. These are just a few of them. There's several states, like I said, that have black heritage commissions that have African-American historians, uh, cultural leaders, church leaders that work through these different counties. So that when archeology span comes, and when there's an undertaking, the State Historic Preservation Office isn't relying just on, you know, whatever archaeologists from whatever state coming in. They've got people who have, you know, work with these different significance recommendations, but also help the State Historic Preservation Office see things that maybe were overlooked by archaeologists who don't know everything, right? Now, the other thing that ends up happening in the case of Alabama is they have some really good promotional uh, information and literature for these different historic properties that are important in black Alabama history. And so this is one way that if you've got a group of folks who know the black history of the state, you don't have to start at ground zero. You can really rely on these people and let them, you know, help you make these kind of significant decisions. So one of the other thing that's really powerful is multiple property documentation forms. You know, those really feed into these statewide contexts, but Sometimes there's states or cities that have multiple different black history, um, uh, historic properties, putting them together into some kind of synthesis so that archeologists can read it and can see, oh, these 85 different streets and houses and buildings and locations, they're all you know, significant under this theme, right? So they can really help put things in theme. Now, Detroit has one that's actually really good. It's got uh, you know, a, a bike and a pedestrian tour where you can go to these different places and you can see these different uh, historic properties and they all pertain to the civil rights effort in the city of Detroit. So this is a situation where they've actually gotten a lot of these historic properties, filled the forms all the way out, architects, other people work together. They, they actually completed it all and put it together as a historic context for folks that see a building that's maybe mid 20th century, you know, is it significant or not? Oh yes, this was part of a significant rally. Maybe it should be protected. Maybe we shouldn't uh, damage it, right? So the state of California does not have a statewide African-American historic context, but several different locations do. San Francisco has an African-American uh, historic context that um, it uh, talks a lot about um, the definitions of integrity and thresholds that matter for black history in the city. 
the other thing that they've got too is this uh, African American cultural society that that could be the beginnings of you know this group at least in the city of uh, San Francisco that makes recommendations to the Historic Preservation Commission for the city. These black folks that have been curating black history in the city know a lot of stuff. Really help out archaeologists who maybe have a project in San Francisco, but they don't really know all the same things that these folks do, right? So that's the, that's a foundation that could really be built if there is some kind of connection there along with the city of San Francisco's Historic Preservation Commission. And that's another thing that we see where there's counties and cities and stuff that are doing great stuff, but it's not really synchronized together. And then it also doesn't go up to the state level a lot of times. Uh, another one, um, the state of Texas, which is, you know, it's in the middle. It's like many other states as far as uh, addressing uh, African-American historic properties. There's several archaeologists that realize and, and agency archaeologists in the state of Texas that realize their projects are more commonly affecting these black neighborhoods and these black sites. So they work together with other folks, African-American archaeologists and other people to put together a best practices for doing African-American archaeology in the state of Texas. So, you know, once again, you don't have to get a master's degree in black history. Some people have already given you the, the crumbs to start on that pathway. It really helps. But it's interesting in this case because they proactively identified that their activities were just slipping past the state um, uh, um, preservation laws and also the National Historic Preservation Act. All right. So this whole thing's going on. You know, there's folks in here, some folks probably listening, you know, they do cultural resources, but it's super easy for us to be like this. I don't do this, right? I mean, I just teach these classes. So what, how could I possibly help? You know, one of the things that's super absent is universities in every state being involved in any of this. This is CRM companies and transportation folks and folks in the Air Force and State Historic Preservation Office. There's not really universities that are stepping into this space. And we that was just most of the time completely blank, right? So, you know, the folks that are here have this unique position because we're the ones who teach the folks who get the degrees that go out and do this stuff, right? So we're the ones who have, uh, you know, a chance to really get involved in this thing in a way that, like other folks, you know, um, they don't have the same pressures. The people at the State Historic Preservation Office that are trying to put race on a form in Florida, yeah, that's, that's you know, not as easy as it looks, right? In New York State, that's not as hard. In California, that's not as hard. So there's some folks who live in places that really could get this going in the place where they live. And you know, some of the recommendations I have, this, I wanna move into questions here, but st support these state historic preservation offices. Um, you know, a lot of times they don't have the archeologists that are out there. They're not the ones who are training and teaching people a lot of times how to do archeology span field work. Um, we talk to most of them. A lot of times they just show up to the SHPO's office and there's a stack of reports. They read through as many of them as they can that day and every day they come back and there's another stack. And it's a never ending process of all day, just making sure that these companies and these projects are in compliance. And that was one of the things they were saying, yeah, we read these reports and by luck we know there was a black town here, but you know we don't have the capacity to create this kind of stuff. So that's where universities really reaching out and trying to connect with these different state historic preservation offices and also proactively learning about black history and black sites, right? So that's another critical piece. The other thing that universities have a unique position, we can actually share this information and include black history, the stuff that we know. We can work with other people working on campus that are doing black history to get this kind of stuff out there in a way that it gets to the state historic preservation office. And if we don't have these statewide contexts, it's spread and it's shared. Because once again, we're not the ones who are under the gun um, a, a lot of times. And then share these reports that we have, share this with other people of African descent who are living in neighborhoods that are right now getting ripped. Uh, they could know that they have these rights under historic preservation law. Then of course, work with CRM companies, work with communities and, and build out this network of scholars so that the work that's done by the people in the, the committee or the task force doesn't just you know, wither away. You know, the other thing too, as I was walking to campus, I was seeing them build that undergrad building over there, 50 feet or so, 50 yards away from Strawberry Creek. And I'm just shaking my head because this place, 
has spent years before I got here, a hundred years ago, digging up native sites on campus, right? Uh, that we didn't even keep track of where the people are at, you know? Do you know who did the National Cultural Resource Management of that property? I mean, do you know No, that? no, but, but I, you know, this is being recorded. I want folks to recognize this university and other land grant universities are complicit in this kind of stuff and it keeps happening. So University of California may not have to worry about sequel when it comes to housing, but the National Historic Preservation Act, I know the federal grants I get partially go to this place. They're a partially federally funded agency. And to be out of compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act, I got a lot of questions on how you can dig a hole that's 12 feet deep in an archaeology sensitivity zone that's a few meters away from Native American villages and and no one know, like no one know, right? Because the other projects that are happening here, I don't know who else's heritage sites. I know that years ago I looked on the map, People's Park was a whole neighborhood of buildings there. You could see the foundations in the grass in aerial photos in 2017. I don't know where the NHPA compliance with that. I don't know if it qualifies, you know, I don't know what to say. But the other thing that we can do is try to get our own institutions to follow the law or at least make others aware that the law exists that they're violating, right? So, I mean, I don't know what to say. That doesn't fall in line with African-American sites, but I just saw the dozers and I'm looking through the fence like there, there's a town, someone's town is right there. Anyway, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the end, we pay for this thing. It's, it's ours, for better or for worse. If there's anyone who's going to fix it or change it, it's going to be us, the people in this room, the people who have to work under this law, and the other people who support the State Historic Preservation Offices and CRM companies. They're the ones, we're the ones, uh, you know, who can work on this. And the fact that Black sites are being overlooked, that can be remedied. This just raises awareness to something that everyone... Uh, is, has the ability and, and the right to be able to, you know, engage in this kind of thing. So folks who are interested, there are the reports. You can get them for free. Um, you can see our synthesis. And then also, I believe, I believe the data, if you, if you don't, if the Excel files are not on there, please reach out to me and I can, uh, I can get people the Excel files so they can actually look at the data. And then of course, my colleagues all over the country that worked on this thing for two years, this would have never happened if it hadn't have been for all these folks who do this archaeology work. And then, of course, Josh Torres, the um, assistant um, archaeologist with the National Park Service, really being behind this whole idea of trying to um, find ways for the National Park Service to be involved with increasing coverage and improving our understanding of different histories, African-Americans, all different kinds of folks. So none of this would have happened if it wasn't for this cast of folks. Um, you know, deep respect and much love. Thank you. Yes, please, Dr. Sinceri. Thank you for this super necessary talk and for your efforts and for your work, your labors to put those together, sir. Um, and I was just thinking about um, like an example of trying to follow the path, right? And, and so like, sorry. So the idea that like starting from say, working with the African-American Male Achievement Program at Garfield at Oakland mm -hmm. through the auspices of every fourth grader in a national park program, right? So everybody gets their national parks pass. We get the idea that we get the kids up. We have the only African-American ranger in Yosemite National Park mm -hmm. behind us. We have a plan. We even have a UC reserve out, yeah. outside, right? Across the street from uh, Ninth Cavalry campsite right mm -hmm. we have the buffalo soldiers there we got shelton johnson involved we got the folks at garfield involved and then you hit a wall yeah. and you hit a wall and you hit a wall and it's like there's also the, the the tension between like i'm not the person to tell folks in yosemite or the uc reserve that that they shouldn't do what they're doing although i certainly did yeah right like i was all up in the, the girl about this but it was also like there's some like organizational linkage missing where there wasn't like a tipo to give them the riot act. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm trying to figure out how I could assist building the capacity to create that fist 
to make those people. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, and I absolutely get you because that whole thing about the national historic preservation act, the reason why it's functional to teach the NHPA is because it's the granddaddy and it applies across the United States and all territories. However, Below that are many different layers at the state and local level too. So sites could get caught up in that whole system. Then there's a wealth of environmental and other workplace regulations too. That the, the whole thing is you know, a, a quite complicated system. But when we're talking about uh, you know, the thing that you're saying, in the case of federal agencies, that's their obligation to be the caretakers for um, historic properties. And uh, what's interesting about it is there's... there's um, Allowing a site to erode or decay is actually a historic preservation decision. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that's a cultural decision. Others, that's like an inevitable decision. But right. they have to state that and mitigate adverse effects, right? So if the sea is rising and there is no seawall and to build a seawall will kill animals and cause a lot of problems, then you need to acknowledge this is the rate at which this thing is eroding. It is falling away. Our yeah. world is changing. Right. We have excavated X amount of portion and that's like all we can do because we can't stop the ocean. Right. In the other case of folks trampling things, right? Tons of people, wildcat camping and doing whatever they want. The agency is supposed to be stepping in like, no, these are, you know, petroglyph sites or these are, you know, important sites. These are African-American, um, uh, you know, Buffalo soldier camps. You cannot go here. It is right. against the law to go here. We're, right. we're moving roads away. We're moving rocks in the way, right? Um, to get someone to do that, uh, it's difficult uh, for a lot of, you know, it's difficult to really get this whole thing to move. Running into that wall, sometimes it's not a wall. It's like a lack of momentum. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like everyone was excited and then it got really hard and complicated. And now we're just kind of like here. And we yeah. did a bunch of things and it could last for years and years before the next round of people get there. So that's also something to acknowledge. And then on positionality, right? It's dangerous for some people to act. They could lose their livelihood. You know, we could actually damage our own health and our own time by putting everything into these things. And at some point, some people have to really think about managing our, 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 uh, you know, energy, right? Because we're not the same use if we're all broken and damaged and overworked. Right. Um, because the amount of work that we have to do is huge. There's no way we'll do every single bit of it. Choose your piece and work at your level of ability and try to push through those walls. Right. So if you have a specific thing in mind, reaching out, finding other people to collaborate with, right. Uh, sometimes the fist is, you know, you break your hand when you hit something really hard. Right. <laughs> so maybe you shouldn't be using your fist. Maybe some other tool is the tool, right. but you know, to just think about it as like a long-term project that, that, yeah, we're, you know, we're stalled, we're moving through, we're finding our way through the bureaucracy. Sometimes it takes people to get retired or laid off or new people to come in new, uh, um, mandate from the agency, right? Someone sues someone in Missouri that now all of a sudden in California, that, president they better do something sometimes those things are breakthroughs but just stick with it right that's yeah. the only thing that i can say until it, if it causes harm to you then it's time to back away and just deaccelerate yeah. right yeah i guess i'm just thinking about what one of, one of the important slides you had up there was about building capacity yeah and like i feel like i was wasting a lot of those energies trying to convince people who don't want to hear it you know and then instead if i build if i focused energy and fund streams and all those labor yeah. into capacity building more locally so that when they say it, it has more power yeah. than when some whiny academic, you know, pencil neck shows up and like says, you should do this. Yeah. Right. So I was just thinking about building those coalitions and, and you know, that, that to me is one of those things where we're le we're less trained on and we're still trying to work. Yeah. On. Yeah. Building co coalition building is critical piece, right? Cause all those examples I showed you would not have happened if it wasn't for those people knowing each other and then kind of just getting the ball rolling the whole um, black sites task force that wouldn't have gotten together if it hadn't have been several different things with people kind of working towards a goal that yeah. then grows into another thing. So the goal would be to try to take this information and see if we can build another coalition or if people can build their own coalitions for their own states, right? Yes, sir. Thank you, doctor. Yes, please. Thank you. That was informative. So I don't work in the U.S. much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, um, I know you, you showed this hard work by a big group of people yeah. for two years and you came up with two sort of documents yeah. that you had on your last slide and they're out there for people. Is the project to, uh, I mean, obviously, as you say, it's never ending, just one step. Is, the, is it part of the goal to 
give those, make sure people across the U.S. kind of office by office, state by state, tipo by tipo, shipo by shipo, yeah. receive this. I mean, push the button and send it out. So, I mean, rather than saying, oh, it's there, or we are dear so-and-so involved yeah. in archaeology, we just want to share this with you so you're aware of it. I mean, it's one thing to go to the SHA and say, hello, yeah. we're aware of it. It's another to send it to every, every kind of state uh -huh. or every office or every county. I mean, is that kind of, is there a game plan to kind of, after your hard work, getting it out there? No, we did do that. And then each person has kind of moved on to their own perspective, right? Because some of the colleagues on that list uh, are now like defending their freedoms to even think, right? Or for their to, to, to be education, you know, Texas, Florida, those are places where a lot of people live. There's a lot of motivation to not really think about this kind of stuff. And so something like the things that we asked of the, it's hard. Some people can't make that kind of decision. They'll lose their job, right? So, so, so some folks have had to kind of hibernate. Other groups have formed, uh, for example, several of the people on that are now working with the NPS and other CRM people to put together a whole workshop to re revise the early house reports mm -hmm. to really guide archaeology for years. You know, that the folks who were on that really, are, you know, they're part of this. They're the facilitators. We're the ones who have gone out and tried to get funding and, and reserve the space for that. So that's going to happen in the um, spring, in May. I guess that's the summer, right? So, um, you know, that, that's what some people have done. Then other people did go back to their state historic preservation office and were like, look, there's nine states that have this thing. Uh, and also what's interesting is some states that have very few African-Americans have historic preservation plans for uh, a statewide context or a statewide survey of historic properties. Idaho has one. Montana has one, right? How come California doesn't have one? So it's not evenly distributed, but some people did go back to their states and say, look, this is just working with historians and, and you know, putting this thing, the records together, right? So, so there has been movement. There have been people who have called these site forms out to try to look you know, county by county, where are these historic properties that are associated with African descent so we can put them together into a database you know, one by one out of these thousands. So folks are doing stuff. Uh, it did move forward and, and people are kind of going the next direction. And so the, it, it raised the, the visibility of this to the National Park Service that administers the Historic Preservation Fund at a time when politically... 30% of our states said that they couldn't even think about diversity, you know, so it, it like ended up, I guess, like Dr. Sincero was saying, running into a wall, right? But the, the, the movement will continue in other states, right? So, you know, and sometimes it was the states you wouldn't really think of, like Alabama, that are really out in the lead when it comes to historic preservation. They're really kind of out there. You know, Georgia, you might expect there's a lot of people that live there, but Alabama, how did they get to the top? Texas, which we growth, but then they're the ones who have this archaeology context for the whole state. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't an even process across any of the states. It was really just ad hoc committees like this one putting things together. Now everybody sees these ideas, all those shippos, they got this report. They see the recommendations. People in those states are really trying to work with those offices to see what little piece they can do. Yeah. <laughs> I would think that there would be, could be grants. Um, yeah. And especially from here in California, there's a number of foundations, especially in the Bay Area, that are going to keep going with this issue of mm -hmm. diversification. And it would be wonderful to have an internship program, for yeah. example. So when you go to the State Historic Preservation Office, you say, well, we have an intern who will help you with this, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And that would be great to launch the students, former students or students into, you know, becoming more professional and so forth. So, you know, and that's a big deal. I mean, somebody has to say, okay, that's what I'll do my time on. Yeah. Even if, and of course, there's always the pressure in, well, both in CRM firm to work on a pro the project, get that done, yeah. or in academia to get your, you know, mm. your tenure, your merit and so forth. So carving out something like that is not always a possible thing to do but it is a way to go forward right i'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of federal agencies it's easier for them to create internships than actual salary jobs right yeah right and so they'll you know that's really really hard to go through the office of personnel to get a position created okay. but it only really takes like that office to work together and one example is folks at the army corps in san francisco realizing that sites are eroding on the bay area have been willing to hire two students to work on this issue and to 
to really learn what the Army Corps does when it comes to climate change, erosion, and all these things. And uh, some of our anthropology students have gotten that internship. So that's also another pathway, right? Like the National Park Service, Army Corps, Department of Defense, they could be making these interns that then by proxy end up managing those lands, even though they're not doing the whole entire state. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe it's on us to be the ones to build a resource database or, you know, yeah. to then advise the students, right? You know, who is giving these internships and so forth. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, anyway, that'd they, be a good idea. You're yeah. right. Anybody else? Can yeah, I'll just. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I came in late, Bill, but uh, yeah, that's great, great material covered. So is, I know this might be a better question over a drink, but is there kind of a gr Bill White grand plan now that now that you're tenured and you're, you know, you understand the state of California and all the issues of archaeology here? <laughs> have you got a plan that you're putting into action in terms of so you were, you were wise to ask that on the 31st of the month, right? <laughs> Because then the plan is to make it to the first to get paid. And then, like, by the end, like, oh, yeah, I'm full of plans. You know, at the beginning, and my only plan is to well, go maybe, to the bar. Maybe right I should now. ask this at the end of the semester, then. Maybe I'll take you, I'll yeah. take you out for a drink, then. <laughs> it's always tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, working with the, the Early House revisions, you know, that's, that's a pretty big workshop thing. You know, there's 40 people who are going to mm -hmm. come to West Virginia and just do this week long workshop to talk about uh, retention, you know, um, diversity, training, the job outlook, right? And the goal of that is to build these kind of cohorts of folks of different ages that are, you know, working across companies and stuff to kind of move this stuff forward in a, in a more, you know, broad way. Because those early, I don't know if folks know the early house reports in the 1970s, archaeologists got together and they, you know, had a, a week long workshop, several weeks, and they, you know, paid their wives to type up their crazy ideas. It's ridiculous. There's only one woman that was involved, right? One native person. So anyway, they came up with these grandiose ideas that strangely have become like the reality of cultural resources and the way that the NPS, because if you look at the folks who were part of that 50 years ago, they went on to be uh, big shots in, in the National Park Service and stuff. And so they really did kind of set the tone. So the idea is to have an inclusive group of folks that write their own work and, and plan for the future, right? But I mean, I am trying my best to build partnerships with cultural resources companies and agencies. They need people on a level that I've never seen in my career. And the absolute threat is there that if these, if we don't get, you know, this work done, Congress will scrap it. Uh -huh. And they'll make an unlimited range of exceptions so that no one has to care about historic properties ever again. Uh, and so we've learned a lot in the last 50 years about archaeology in North America. A lot of it's coming from this kind of mandated research. If we don't get more people to go into archaeology, like, I mean, in the past, the thing that has kept it is that archaeologists keep lobbying and pushing for there to be historic preservation laws. Yeah. There could be a day when, like, no one's there doing that. Yeah. And they just say, oh, it's a huge bottleneck. I can't do anything. Guess what? We're not the Department of Defense, Transportation and Housing, and no one has to worry anymore about sites unless they want to. Yeah. And if that happens, you know, all, all these sites that we're discovering as glaciers melt and all this other stuff, you know, all these neighborhoods that become potentially eligible for the National Register every year, whole subdivisions, dozer, they're yeah. open to, you know, elimination. Yeah. So I really want folks to learn how to do archaeology and to get hired and to do the kind of stuff however they do it. And I'm trying to find companies to hire students, you know, so that folks can see, get an anthro degree, you just go right into the workplace. Like that's what I really want to see happen. That's the grand plan, right? Yes. Can you make a plug for the R Field School? <laughs> yes, please. And also, okay. Because it's open now, students can apply. For All right. So folks, the applications for the archaeology yeah. research facilities field school this summer at Peralta Adobe yes. in Oakland are open. Uh, we're looking for students from the state of California, California state universities. You'll get college credit, a stipend. You get to interact with other cultural resource management and other archaeologists here in the Bay Area. And folks who have taken it, they say it's a really good program. So they're getting jobs. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're feeding, uh -huh. as you were just saying, they need, we need more archaeologists. They're feeding the system. Yep. It's so feeding. field school is an excellent opportunity. And we have a... Um, uh, um, 
forum that will come this spring, right? We do every, Correct. is yep. it with cultural resources? Yes, for... Sarah will release, we have the date already. Okay. Yep, I can't remember it, but yeah. So March, sometime in folks March. who can't all come to Oakland can tune in for the uh, forum with, will it be, it'll be cultural resources? I or think it's agencies. Agen okay. I think it's agencies this year. March 15th. Okay, March 15th March will 15th. be the forum with agency archeologists here at the ARC, but it'll also be on. Zoom, right? Zoom available. Zoom. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So if you're yeah. in one of those far eastern states like Colorado, you can tune in <laughs> and see agency archaeologists talk about their careers. Yes, please. Hi, Bill. Um, yeah. Thank you. Really interesting. And there's actually a question in the chat that I'll okay. read. Yeah. Um, and it's a geospatial question. So oh, okay. Great. Happy to see it. Okay. So Todd Altman, wrote, ah. while you were speaking, he wrote, there's also the Texas Freedom Colonies Project that is a community-based effort to identify black settlements and cemeteries across the state. Data are mapped and available for all to see. The SHPO and Council of Texas archeologists recommend that CRM archeologists review this project before heading into the field. Here's the link and it's the www, the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, it got cut off. <laughs> <laughs> Project.org or .com, I don't know. That I'm glad that Dr. Allman wrote in because he's also doing great work and doing field work, trying to get students out there and teaching people how to do field methods and is in Texas, what huge state, a lot of development and a lot of archaeology sites and a lot of demand for archaeologists. So mm -hmm. I hope we can put that in the comments for the video. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. idea. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I'm still waiting for that drink, so we're going to stop <laughs> before Dr. Lightfoot leaves and forgets that he promised it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Yeah. All right, thanks.